Now, hi, John. Um, welcome to, to the show today. It's fantastic having you, you on. Uh, John Quilter, also known as, as the infamous um, food busker. And um, yeah, it's, it's great, great having you here. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you, bye. Fantastic. Well, actually, it's, um, it's quite um, interesting with you because you, you, for the past couple of months, um, you've, you've um, kind of been a little bit more quiet on the, on the, on the screen, but also uh, because you had an incident. Are you, are you feeling, feeling better? Could you tell us what um, happened? Yeah, basically, um, just at the beginning of lockdown in the UK, um, I, um, my back went, um, my back went basically, I've got a ruptured uh, disc V1, um, and, um, but known as a slip disc. So, um, and basically it's been, yeah, it was quite challenging to be honest. Um, it's, um, basically being rendered disabled is really challenging. And, uh, I, I essentially couldn't do anything, um, no exercise. So I've only just started exercising in the last four weeks. Um, but yeah, it was, it's, it's been a really debilitating, challenging time, but my experience is, is whenever something like that happens, um, as difficult as it is, as it is, there's always something on the other side that's a bit of a game changer if you don't give up. So yeah, it's been, um, it's taken me to some unexpected places. So before we were, uh, before we started talking about an hour ago, I was swimming in the River Thames because that's my new uh, form of exercise. And um, yeah, it's taken me to some, you know, I'm exploring all different solutions to solve my back. So I went and saw like a shaman energy healer stroke five point acupuncturist uh, last week, which was interesting as well. So yeah, it's kind of takes you to funny places. <laughs> Interesting. Is there anything, anything in particular where you notice as like, wow, that's that's completely changed for, for me right now? Um, well, I think I think that it's um, there's a couple of things. I think that um, when you're in pain and when you get stopped, it make it tends to make you far more open-minded, and um, that's a good thing. And um, the injury essentially came from when you're a chef and you're working at a bench, you're slightly bent over like that, and um, and so for years, that's the position that I was in. And it meant that my core wasn't used and that my lower back muscles were used too much. Um, and essentially, it was always going to happen. It was just a question of when. Um, so it's interesting to, to just understand why it happened. It's interesting to, um, I don't know, I, I think when shit goes wrong, it is an opportunity. You know, you've just got to work through the stuff. So, yeah. Right, right. But um, well, good, good, good to hear that uh, that it's, you know you're you're back to while well, you're coming you're on your way back to uh, to old glory, let's say you know, uh, or new glory even you know if you if you find something new. But uh, what do you um, how do you are you already are you already able to go go back to cooking? Um, are you yeah? How, are you going back to, to for instance old old habits? Um, yeah, I guess what I've been. Um, what, what I've done is I, I've taken the opportunity, um, like I, I, I've taken the opportunity of five months of doing nothing to do all the things that I was too busy to do. Um, and so a lot of that is about, um, you know, I've always been, I've always been a big advocate of therapy and a big advocate of um, uh, development, both sort of emotional, spiritual, intellectual. So um, I've done a lot of reading, a lot of growth, and I, and that's where I I kind of feel like the 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 opportunity for new doors to open. If you look at yourself, your skills, your abilities as a business, uh, and and that's a limited resource. And and whenever you're in business, you're always looking for a game changer. You're always looking to like find thirty. Like if you could find an extra thirty percent optimization of your business, you'd be like, shit, that's amazing. And, and that's kind of how I approach myself. And so when something like this happens, it's, 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 it, it's exciting as, as challenging as it is, because I feel like that there is an opportunity to, to learn something or discover something. So that's kind of led me um, to, to, to just all manner of stuff. 
Um, and that tends to open new worlds. So I've been watching uh, more sort of media, more uh, shows, and that begins to start getting the creative juices flowing eventually. Um, so I'm beginning to just plan some series that I'm looking at doing. Um, and I've got some brand relationships that I've been talking to those brands about things. So it's kind of, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of cooking. I did, I did some donuts the other day that were incredible, if I do say so myself. Oh, very nice. Now, a good donut, uh, you know, can also change the entire day to the, to the, for the better. Um, but, you know, for everybody listening, um, could you um, give, us, give us a walkthrough of your story, just so that everybody you know, understands who the infamous John is? Sure. Okay. Well, um, so my background is a, as a restaurateur and a chef. Um, I was a chef when uh, it wasn't cool to be a chef. So basically, uh, I've got dyslexia, which means that um, uh, it's, a, it, it's considered a learning disability. Um, and back when I was in school, they didn't really know what it was. So that meant that I didn't do academically well. Um, so you, and, and so back then, you were limited in what you got involved in. And I became a chef. And, um, and uh, I, I worked hard at that. I ran a number of restaurants. I, I went through the ranks. Um, and then and that led to me in my own restaurant. And I operated that for four years. It was award winning. Um, and it was, it's, I guess it's like, I don't know how many dreams you've gone through, but I think when you have your first dream in your, as a teenager and 20 something, you think that's it, I'll get that. And then I'll be dead happy and I'll live happily ever after. And that's how I thought about having a restaurant. Um, I had my restaurant and it was, and it didn't work out the way that I thought it, it would. Um, it wasn't happily ever after it was really tough it was really shit there were lots of challenges and i made um some rookie mistakes when it came to the lease and so four years into that experience i was just like you know i'm good at doing this it won best new restaurant in manchester when i opened um i was getting some tv exposure and i was the local food presenter on uh, the local channel local satellite channel but i was miserable and it wasn't really it wasn't fulfilling me in the thought in the way that i thought it was it, i want I, I thought it would um and so four years into that i took the huge decision to step away from that and um and that was that was awful it was really difficult because in order to secure the lease i, I i'd had to get i gave my mortgage uh, as um to secure it and so long story short four years in i i made the momentous choice to step away and to like go and pursue a different type of life i wasn't sure i wasn't following the rule book anymore i wasn't doing what everybody told me to do um so i had to close the restaurant it was just at the same time as the financial crash of 2008 so i wasn't able to sell it um i lost my house i lost the restaurant, I lost my car, I literally lost everything, went bankrupt. And, and, and at the, I think it was like 34, something like that, 35, it was just, uh, the whole thing just went, fell off the side of a cliff. And it was, it was terrifying and scary, but at the same time, it was like, fuck, I feel, it was also really like, ah, this is amazing. And rather than following all the rules that I learned at school, um, or that people had told me, I decided to just do to just be like right i'm going to follow my heart i'm going to do things that i want to do so for about two weeks after i closed the restaurant i was like right i'm going to move to la i'm going to surf and i'm going to become an actor and two weeks after i was like what the fuck are you going on about you are crazy you have lost your house your restaurant you you know like there's people walking down the road and crossing the street so they don't have to talk to me it was like it was just this crazy journey um and so I set myself some rules is that I couldn't take a job um, that, 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 that I, and I needed to sort of like pursue what my heart wanted rather than the sane thing to do. And my dad was having babies, people were losing their shit. It was like, it was a really interesting time because it's interesting to see how other people around you react to you when you're going through this sort of thing. And you find out who your friends are. Um, anyway, so I dropped out and followed these rules. I'm not gonna take a job. 
I'll do so I did a bit of consultancy here and there I start I did I pursued more of my media career and then I moved to London and um and then I came up with this idea of like right you know maybe I cook I wanted to cook something I'd, I'd done an acting course and it hadn't worked out I was like right I'm going to pursue this kind of like media food media thing and it was just when the street food scene in London was taking off about 10 years ago and um and, 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 and these people knew me and they invited me down to the, to the real food market on the South Bank, which is a bit of an iconic market. And, um, and so I rocked up there and they were like, could you do food demonstrations? And I was like, that would just sounds so sodding boring and so every day. And so like, not what I'm trying to communicate, which was a, an edginess, um, food up to that point it had been very middle class. It had been very white. It had been very privileged. It had been about well-educated, um, privileged people who had the time to enjoy food. It didn't really reflect the sort of, mu you know, the, sh the, the music scene that I come from, uh, the, the, the sort of rave scene of the late 80s, early 90s. That was far more like street culture than it was about food. There was this big difference between those two worlds. And street food was beginning to bring those worlds together in like you know you were having like food raves and things like that so I was like what I should do is is do something different so I came up with the idea that I would cook on the streets I cook food different every week people would come and watch that and, ha and see the experience of it being cooked and then I would ask them to pay for the food but rather than charging them a set price I said you pay me what you think the food is worth and I called it food busking and um yeah, and I did that for a year on the streets. It wasn't the best business model. Lots of people were like, this is never going to make any money. You're crazy. But I think that's the thing when you're like creating something original is often people don't get their head around it. Often people see all the things that can't work and they can't see the possibilities. And I knew that that was never going to be a financial model. But I always saw the media opportunity, the bigger brand opportunity. So anyway, I did it for a year in the snow, in the rain, in the sunshine, many times thinking, you should have listened to those people. <laughs> you, know, you know, this is not going to work out. Um, and then towards the end of that period, the Evening Standard, which is the, the main London newspaper, picked it up. And then a month after that, Jamie Oliver, um, his production company got in touch and was like, um, this is great. We really like it. Would you like to be part of a TV series we're doing? And would you like to, um, would you be up for starting a YouTube channel with us? And it, and it was great because it was like, boom, that's it. That's, that's the, the lift I needed. That's, I needed somebody within the food media world to be like, ah, I get what this guy's trying to do. I get it. I get it's this mechanism for showing food, but also people and breaking down barriers. Interesting. So that was like, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. And um, from there, the channel was born. I shot the TV series, which was called Food Junkies, um, which I was one of the contributors uh, within that program. And, um, and then went on this wicked, crazy, cool ride, um, which was Food Busker. Just, just to clarify, so um, is it now your YouTube channel or is it a YouTube channel that is like uh, owned by like the production company of Jamie Oliver? How's that looking like? Yeah, it's my channel. So basically, um, what was it like? Eight years ago, YouTube went wanted to um, stimulate creative growth on, the, on, on their platform. Mm -hmm. And so they went out into the world and they were like, right, for we've got a million... We've, I think it was like they got like 50 million or 30, 40 million. And they were like, you can, um, who wants a million to start, to start a new channel or to start something? So people like, I think Jay-Z did it, uh, Jamie Oliver did it, like loads of big hitters in the media world that were used to traditional media were wooed onto the platform with uh, this investment to, to create channels. And so Jamie created his own channel, which was called Food Tube. It's now called Jamie Oliver. And Jamie being Jamie, he, um, he wanted to create this network. And so he, the, 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 the sort of founding group, there was four or five of us, 
that got that he that he helped create YouTube channels. Um, so and and the deal was is it was my channel, but that he his production company made the production. Um, so he shot it. He, so his guys shot it and edited it. Um, and yeah, and it was like, you know, I I was really really lucky to get that to get that in with Jamie. Like Jamie's arguably the most successful um chef in the world from a media perspective i'm pretty sure that's accurate that he is number one mm. he's certainly the biggest uh published uh chef in the world um and he's basically published a book and a tv series every year for the last i think it's 13 or 14 years probably more than that so so he and he had his own production company and so having that there was there was lots of positives from that. There were some negatives, but on the whole, it was this incredible start in life in the food media world. It's a very interesting case because it's quite rare uh, among creators that they um, that they get pushed, um, you know, by by a, a bigger media company. Let's say, right? Um, were there any kind of guidelines at the beginning? So, like, how, how was this channel set up? Or were there, there must have been some conditions in there as well. And and you also mentioned some 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 positive and negative aspects. Like, what 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 were the things? What were the learnings there? So, I think I think what's interesting is is um, you see, when Jamie first blasted onto the screens, it was in the nineties, and it was this really exciting time within television, whether in, in the UK, where they were creating channels that. And they were creating programs for new channels. I think it was like new chat. Was it Channel Four was new? Um, and so when you when they when you start something like that, there are not there are some guidelines, but there's so there's no rules really. It's the wild west. It's like a startup. It's like a fresh piece of paper. And so that so so they were born out of that. And one of Jamie's business partners was a key producer of that time who produced the big breakfast, I think it was. So these guys knew what it was like to set something up. So when the digital version of that happened 15 years, 20 years later, um, they had some experience of just going for it. So the way that it worked from a commercial point of view is that there was a split on the, um, there was a split on the AdSense revenue um, and that was in their favor. And then there were brand deals um, where I would be paid a, um, a talent fee and they would have taken the rest. And, and then they created a digital agency essentially within their TV company where they got lots of sort of like spotty 20 year olds in who could do everything. And they basically, would assign a shooter to two or three talent, I being one of them, and then that guy would shoot, and we worked on the basis that we made one video a week, and we uploaded every week. And so that was incredible, because back then, um, I didn't know anything about anything. All I knew was that I was good in front of the camera, and that I could cook. Um, my what, what my the thing that was good about me is that like i was not intimidated you could drop me into a market with a load of like regular people who who would eat my food and and i i reveled in that environment whereas a lot of chefs or cooks would be like oh real people oh um and so that was kind of like the the, the point of difference um the, the, the and so there were the, so the the positives were were, were amazing because it's like you associated with Jamie Oliver. Jamie's focus was on it, so he was constantly creating opportunities for the people that were in that. He was investing a lot of his own money uh, as well, um, and 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 so it was it was immense. The downsides were that they brought TV quality values and approach and cost to a digital play. And really, a digital play, part of the attraction of YouTube is its lack of production values, i.e. its authenticity, its down-to-earthness, its rawness. And I think that 
that, that, that the idea was that we were going to bring a much higher production value. And in many ways that, that was great, but there was something lost in the process. Um, and, and it was interesting, but there's a number of those people that started a YouTube channel. They don't do YouTube anymore. Um, they were not true kind of, they, they, they were not the people that would have started a YouTube channel on their own. And I think that's one of the key pieces of learning that from that time, it's like, you, in many ways, YouTubers need to be self-starters. They need to be people that have a passion for it. They need to, like when I, now I shoot, I edit, I write, I do the whole nine yards. I, I just did a series for a, a restaurant chain in, in the UK where, where I wrote it, I directed it, I, I appeared in it, I edited it. Um, and I've learned that on the hoof, like that sort of thing of like jump off the building and build the plane on the way down. That's very much been how it has been for me. Um, but, you know, just to be clear, and, and then that financial relationship ended, I think it was four years in. Um, they'd taken a punt at it for four years. And, and Jamie, had, Jamie had had this period of where he just expanded in every area, his restaurant industry, food, media, merchandising, licensing, the whole shebang. And it was it was time to bring it back in. It was to, to start rationalizing that and sort of um, making sure that they were, you know, the, the, the consolidation basically. Um, and this 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 play was not making the money that they they needed it to. And so what eventually happened is is that though the the, the people like me were set free, and now FoodTube is just Jamie Oliver's channel, which I imagine will be far more profitable. Uh, it's a much smaller team creating that. Um, and so sort of four year, three years ago, four years ago, I was kind of like put out into the world on my own. Uh, and I'd never filmed anything. I'd never edited anything. But I created this asset along with the support of Jamie that had sort of changed my reality. It had changed my opportunity from that place where I'd closed the restaurant and people were going, he's fucked. <laughs> you won't see him again to now being in the situation where I was like operating in a completely different world, which was media about creating assets that could make money while you're asleep. And that you had created a mini online TV program and format and become a brand in myself. So it was, it's been awesome. And like Jamie's just the best, you know, him and his people, they're good people. So for, for, for a food YouTuber in general, how does the business look like on YouTube? Is it like in that space? Is it more you make most money from like brand deals or um, you make most money from the AdSense? What does it look like in this, in this niche? So, so it's, it's different for everybody and there's not one approach. The, um, and it's, it's all, it, it, it's different there are a number of factors. So um, you can obviously make money from the AdSense, but you need to get, you need to really start getting good views. And it's not just about the volume of views, but it's about the people watching that. If it's all nine year olds that are watching your stuff, that's not a commercial, that commercially viable. Whereas my audience is, 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 is a great audience because it's sort of like 25, 23 to like 40. Um, so, so that's a far more commercially viable audience. So, so there's that. Then there's the fact that how long are they watching your content for? You might have a hundred thousand views on a five minute video, but they might all be signing off one minute in. So retention's key. And what's, what makes YouTube the king is its level of analytical um, information that you get back from your platform that, that tells you where people are watching, what their age group is, the full run of the demographic, um, how long they watch it for, at what point do they drop off. Um, you can, you really have, it's incredible the level of, of data that you can get with that. And that's why it's really attractive as a proposition to being hooked up to a commercial product. Mm -hmm. um, so, so let's put that to the side for now and come back to, 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 to your question. So basically, 
AdSense is, is, is one way to earn money, but it can be really difficult to get up to the numbers. The second one is um, brand deals. So, you, so if you're creating content that is commercially viable, so my content's pr pretty commercially viable, I can, f I, you know, I can go to America and be paid by the tourist board to tell a, a food story because food has become one of the drivers, key drivers in travel. I can take a bottle of ketchup and use that on a burger and that, that, that can work that way. Um, there's lots and lots and lots of opportunities for me to commercialize it through, through uh, that way. Then there's Patreon or other platforms like that where you create, um, uh, your community wants to pay you. And YouTube recently created the membership scheme, which is the same sort of thing, um, where you pay a subscription. And then the fourth way is that you might create a standalone course or a community where let's say you get exclusive content. So via e-commerce, you go on to, you come off YouTube, you come onto my platform, you subscribe and you get specific information, be that like a nutritional recipe, whatever, I don't know. Um, and then there's add on, the fifth way is merchandise, books so there's there's five different ways that i can think of that are, that are valid to me what um, say is um it's like for your case um it's roughly the split is it like 50 percent adsense 20 percent this like what would you say i would say that so on my channel's 273,000 subscribers and i've got like 35 million views um i consider myself to be a so hard to 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 because YouTube is such a big massive thing it's global but I wouldn't consider myself to be a massive massive YouTuber I think once you get to a million subscribers there's something about that where um, it's much bigger so I would say that I'm a mid range lower mid range YouTuber um, so my income I would say is ninety percent brand deals mm -hmm. sponsorship and ten percent AdSense now I've got a friend who is uh, 1.2 million subscribers um and i and his earnings would be far more like 50 60 percent adsense because a it's enough to live off and b he then doesn't have to answer to a boss being a brand um i.e the brand might say well i want it done this way and he's like well i don't want to do it that way so so the so the opportunity is that you can get to AdSense. I, I think you can make AdSense work if you're getting 100,000 views per video per week. Then I reckon you're kicking. It's, it's so difficult because the point is, is that AdSense is about advertisers seeking to put adverts in front of your content. So you might have a, you might have a channel on about cars and it's not a six and it's not as attractive as my, as mine on food let's say and so we might be getting exactly the same views but i'll get more adsense because it's at the time that's more attractive so but i think if you're only if you're getting a hundred thousand views a week um then i think you're probably you could get up to like two and a half three grand a month uk um which is you know it's okay and then i mean uh, i i i was uh, uh, kind of assuming also that you make uh, most of your money from brand deals especially in the food space it seems to me with the rise of like the uh, direct to consumer brands and like um anyways especially like this whole transformation of like food and it becomes more important like the brands people really look like do they use oatly now or they use that brand so it makes sense to to, to for the brands to, to to talk to you guys so can you talk a bit more about like how these brands approach you? What are your like negotiation tactics and like how does it work? Sure. So um, f first you've got to get on, you've got to get to a certain point. And it's not necessarily about numbers. It's not necessarily about levels of subscribers. Mm -hmm. It is about, but that obviously plays a part because brands want, coverage to a, to, to a certain amount of people. However, it's not the be all and end all. 
the, the quality of what you're producing, what you stand for as a talent, these are all, and these are all elements. Once you're on their radar, then I, I probably get 95% of the business that comes to me comes through my YouTube channel where they just get in touch via email. Um, and um, yeah, you've got, majority of the time it will be through creative agencies that are um, assigned to a brand so that classic marketing relationship where a brand goes to a, a, an agency and that agency is out there finger on the pulse trying to, to, to get their campaign out with the right sort of people that's that's probably the majority of it there are also a bunch of um, digital platforms out there twitter has its own which is called niche and what that basically does is is it's a marketplace for brands to meet creators so as a creator you can go on to these platforms put your details in um maybe put some example videos you put the details of who you are what you do i'm in food i've got x amount of subscribers and they they have an algorithm that will, that, that, will, that will meet you up. They also have people within the agency that are, oh, this guy's perfect for that guy. So it's like a dual approach. Um, so that's the sort of classic way. Um, and then really when those people get in touch, like the way, I, I've, the way I've always handled it pretty much is um, that I've, I've had an agent and now I have a manager and I don't, I don't deal with any of the, I don't want to deal with the commercial negotiation because um, A, I'm at a certain level and B, um, I, it changes things when the brand is talking to the talent and also the talent's having the financial negotiation. The traditional model is, is that they can get annoyed and shout about things to the financial department or the agent but it changes the energy of having that with the talent as well. But I think when you start off, you just, most people just do it themselves. It's not a big, you know, it's not a big, um, I would encourage people to do that themselves when they start because it's, um, you know, it's just, it's just the, 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 the uh, it's just the right way because it, it takes time to be able to make it financially work. You're looking at a minimum, of 12 months, I would say probably more like two years worth of investment of creating content on a weekly basis to build an audience to you so you can get to that point where you might make money, you might even be break even. But like the, the, the one I see the biggest mistake out there or biggest presumption that people make is that they're just gonna be able to get on YouTube and create this thing. It's just not gonna work. It's like it's like creating a mini TV series on a mini channel. On, uh, and, and it's like, it's a big undertaking. And unless you have already have a profile or you have some sort of support like I did, then really you need to be doing something that's sustainable that you can do every week for two years. Nice. Uh, interesting. So you brought up media agencies. Um, and I was wondering how, how has it been working with media agencies? Because they, they seem to be the middleman in this, in this whole landscape, right? Yeah. Um, media, it, 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 it's kind of like, it's a mixed bag. There's some wicked, wicked agencies out there that totally get digital and, um, and are really exciting to work with. Um, so what, first of all, like, I think for, for people who don't know what, what media agencies are, could you maybe give a couple of examples uh, of media agencies and, um, and what they do and, and then how, how you actually work with them? So I, I think that um, it's, it's, it's a very confusing space, the media industry, extremely confusing. And there's no, there's no um, just set, set this, is, this is how it is. Um, but broadly speaking, there's like your traditional media agency that um, basically creates marketing material, be that 
TV campaigns, TV adverts, um, print media, um, and now digital campaigns for brands. So basically Ford goes to uh, an agency and says, we're launching the new Fiesta. And it's like, we want you to handle that. So they'll go, right. We, and, and a media agency can do all of these or they, or they might specialize in some of these, but it was like, right. So first off, we're gonna create a TV campaign and we're going to get um, uh, David Beckham to be the guy to do it. We're also then going to do loads of photography. We're going to, create, uh, we're going to use our relationships with the newspapers to, um, we know how to buy media. So what that means is that they regularly buy adv advertising space within TV and print media. So they create the whole package, but they might also create the event where it's David Beckham on a fiesta in London for a day. And, and, and so, they, so they create this whole campaign that's both online and offline. That's what a media agency can do. But then you've also got media agencies like, for example, a channel like Unilad, where that's a uh, started off as a Facebook page where they were creating content, and because they grew their audience so big, they then sell. They're able to sell advertising. They've got somebody within that that digital, which is a digital agency, but it's Unilad, which is an a Facebook content page, and then they're able to go out to Ford and go, "We've got." 2 million followers on Facebook and they're all 25. They're perfect for your audience who want to buy a Fiesta. Why don't you get, and, and, and so not only do they have the platform, but they also have the agency that creates the content for the platform. Um, and so, and, and then there's everything in between there. Um, and so what, and what's traditionally happened, these agencies have traditionally been traditional media, TV, magazines, papers, and the majority of people that have been running these agencies are in their 50s. So they've cut their teeth completely in there, in those traditional ways. So they didn't really get, a lot of them haven't been able to get their head around digital. And just like the Jamie Oliver's production company, where they brought TV values and TV um, learning to this digital space, they, they they got some things right, but they get some things wrong. And really, a lot of the agencies that have done extremely well have been brand new agencies that are exclusively populated by 20-somethings who get how digital media is consumed. I think 70% of my audience watch my content on their phone. Um, and then it's like 20% on, on laptop. Whereas the majority of people that work within um, those agencies uh, certainly 10 years ago, they only watched content via, they wouldn't, didn't even call it content, they called it, you know, it's TV. So the way that media is consumed heavily impacts on how it should be made. And a lot of those agencies have been going through a learning curve with that. So what you'd find is, is that in the early days, they would, they would go to a new, to, to a big YouTuber who got a big audience and there would just be this terrible clunky trying to make this work and this work, bringing them together. It's getting better and agencies understand, you know, the, how it works with me is, is that I, I don't want to, I won't just sell any, anything. I won't, I need to, it needs to be something, uh, the way I've said it for myself is it needs to be something that I would genuinely use because if I suddenly start going, um, you know, if I, let me just think of what I do. I need to, if I'm going to upset a brand, it needs to be one that I don't think about. But it's like, if, if, what would I, I wouldn't start doing an advert for like, I don't know, yeah. let's say I, 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 I you talk to you, I don't know. <laughs> I, might, I might do. <laughs> but it's like, it's like, I, it needs to be authentic. It needs to be something that my audience that's relevant to, to what I'm about, I wouldn't start suddenly selling women's shoes. Mm. Um, you know, if I suddenly started going, oh, they're great. People would be like, piss off. What the hell are you going on about? And it's that. And so, and, and, and so being authentic and being true and, and, and genuinely selling something that you believe in 
and the first raft of, of YouTubers and digital people were just like kind of a lot of them would sell anything and, they, and, they, and then they had massive audience erosion, be that in um, engagement. And engagement is something that old media doesn't, didn't really get because what feedback do you get from a TV advert? You get a, 10 people in a room and you do a test and it's like, that's rubbish compared to what you get on YouTube, which is we can see of, of, of this one minute commercial, everybody 70% clicked off 30 seconds the way through. So you can look at that and you can absolutely pinpoint, ah, when, when, that, when John said, I, you know, I really like this, they all clicked off. You, know, you can have that level of granular dig into digital content that you can't have in print media and you can't have in telly. And so it's you, but the people that are booking those adverts are TV media types. And that was the friction for the, for the beginning when I got into this 10 years ago, it's improved, it's got better. And there's lots of people that understand it. And what happens today is agencies come to me and they go, and they're getting better at it because they go, you make the video, you make the creative, these are what we want. These are the things that we want said. And as long as those things fit within my style and it's a smooth clunk click, then we're then game on. But if it's not, I always go, I go, no thanks. Because it may be a fast book, but my or the, the degradation to my, the integrity of my audience, be that in retention, be that in views, but most importantly, engagement um, is not worth it. It's just not worth it. I mean, what would be interesting as well to know is like, how do you see the, the YouTube community in your niche? Like how, how, how is like the, the relationship with other YouTube uh, creators, but also like how is like the audience, are they like kind of tolerant? Like, um, because like some niches in the food space, I would say are very like drama related. I think like the mukbang scene, like when like they have like lots of drama always going on and it's a lot of like, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you can say toxic behavior, but it's like a lot of things always going on. How is it with you? How are you getting along with uh, your fellow creators? That's a big question, that is. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's, let's talk, about let's, talk the, about, let's come back to the audience. Let's talk about other YouTubers. So a, a, a guy who runs, um, who's a big, player in the in the London media agency brand stuff he ref, he, he refers to me as um, I just happen to be on YouTube I'm a chef who just happens to be on YouTube I don't think I'm your standard YouTube talent um, I've done telly and I'm working on on, on, on on TV things I've got crossover I've written for media so I don't really I'm not a classic youtuber I think a classic YouTuber is somebody that has grown up on YouTube and, 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 and maybe doesn't have a crossover potential. So they're, 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 they're very niche. They've got a particular vibe to them. And you either love them or hate them. You're like, I can't fucking watch that anymore. You know, it's got that element to it. Or, and so, 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 so it's got that almost like, what's the right way to describe it? Um, sort of, I'm trying to find the right word without insulting people, but basically it's a bit ad addictive and that's not necessarily very good. Um, so I, 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 so I'm probably not the best person to, to comment on that YouTube environment on the whole. I'm very disciplined with it. I don't get pulled into stuff. I never have. Um, and I'm not a massive YouTube watcher. Um, but I know my community and I kind of tend to stick within that. And um, on the whole, when I, when I started this seven or eight years ago, there was a great environment of, of, of collaboration and, and working with the YouTubers. And that's one of the key top 10 things you've got to do if you want to build your own channel is collaborate with other people. The problem is, is if you've got 10,000 subscribers and you get in touch with somebody that's got 100,000, you're probably not going to get a response unless you're doing something really cool. Um, so, but YouTube can be really not good for your mental health. It can be really difficult. Like I, I've been put, I put a film out every week 
for something like six years. I never missed a day. It just, uh, every week it just went out. Um, but you can feel like you're just throwing something into a black hole and that you're never really, and that is very, very difficult, especially if you've got a motive that isn't getting satisfied. So for example, uh, I'm doing this to get on telly or I'm doing this to make money. If that's your motive, then you, I think it's going to be difficult for you unless you've got some serious investment. If however, you're like, I really believe about sharing my story about autism or, you know, something that's, that's, that's part of your life that you bloody care about and you share that week in week out, then, then you might get there with something that, so the number one thing is, is, is it's got, you know, we talked about sort of collaboration, but when you're starting a YouTube channel, it's got to be sustainable. It's got to be something that you can fit into your life and you can do sustainably easily that kicks out all the time. So, so yeah, so I think, but I like, and, and, and a lot of the drama tends to happen with young people and, and you know, you've got this unique situation that's happened in the last 20 years where you've got 20 somethings that have more money and more control and more power than they've ever had in the history ever. And it's, it's, a, it's kind of a recipe for some interesting stuff because it's just like, you know, you have these meltdowns and you have people and you've got YouTubers who just suddenly, did, you know, I've got like three millions of and they just suddenly just delete their channel because they're going insane. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's not without its pitfalls. It's not without its, it's, it's problems. That, and, and personally for me, the last two years, I've, my consistency has gone completely out the window this time because of my back. But last year it was just because I got to a point where I was like, I'm not enjoying it. I'm not enjoying what I'm doing. Um, and I put some content out that had the best, the best performance it's ever had, but I wasn't personally happy because I was doing it for the wrong reasons. I'd fallen. I just, when I started off, it was just like really lovely heart centered operating procedure where I was meeting people on the street and cooking food. And then Last year, it was about views. It was about subscribers. It was like, why am I not getting more? Why is it not happening? This is really fucking frustrating, you know. And 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 I and I took the the momentous decision to be like, right, I'm going to just step back. I'm just going to completely step back. And that was the best thing that I ever did. And so, to anybody that's out there trying to build something, you've got to have the, you've got to be able to take a step back sometimes. From an audience point of view. It's, it's very, 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 very interesting. It's very weird sometimes, and it's also amazing. Like, it's nice when you walk down the street and people are like, whoa, food busker, you know? And, and that happens all around the world, where, you know. Do you think like, um, like in the food media space, um, or like on, specifically on YouTube, who is, do you think is really nailing it? Who is like really, he understands like the zeitgeist and is like so good, uh, who, who do you think? I think, so uh, my mate, uh french guy cooking he is um me and him started at the same time and we tracked along the same level and then about a year and a half ago he just went and he's become a fabulous filmmaker mm. and um he's brilliant he's absolutely brilliant um and then i think it's mark mark wines is it or mark wise he's a uh, American speaking Asian guy who goes around and eats places. He's, and it's really interesting. He's a really innocent, simple guy who just is just utter innocent happiness. All he does is go and eat at these places, but he's just nails it. And he goes to some really cool places. So they're two of my top guys. Um, and I think that, um, oh God, uh, Babish, is it banging with Babish? Like he's one of the original guys, but um, yeah, I think I think they're they're brilliant. I really like those guys. Another thing is that you um, you've worked on on a, uh, well, we could say cross platform, right? You actually started in in television, right? YouTube, but you also on Instagram. Um, what do you think of of uh, new platforms that are coming up like TikTok? Jesus, I try I I tried TikTok. Um, yeah, I think. 
I think for, if you're starting afresh, you need to pick a platform that you're going to specialize on. Um, each platform has a specific approach and it's unlikely that you're going to nail two. If it's, it's almost impossible. Best thing to do is to choose one. Like TikTok is getting some ridiculous traction and, and it's really engaging, but, I, but, I, but it's a younger audience. And, you know, I'm in my 40s now and it doesn't really appeal to me. And so, you know, I know lots of people that are like, no, you've got to get on it. And it's like, I, I'm, just not, I'm just not interested because I'm doing well on one platform and I'm interested in long form content. I'm interested in more sort of like enriched formats rather than something that's, that's so small. However, you know, it's like, it's, it's, if you're starting a new and you don't know which platform to go to, the new platform that's emerging like TikTok is probably the place to start. And there's some great stuff on there. Like there's some great comedy on there. It's ridiculously good. And I think that, you know, in the UK, TV tends to track talent on Instagram. And in the US, they tend to track talent on YouTube. Um, and that's not a full picture by any, by any sense, but it's certainly my experience. So, um, yeah, I think that if I was starting afresh, I'd be looking at a, plat a new platform like TikTok. Interesting. Actually, then to actually finalize, um, you know, this this very uh, interesting interview. What I was wondering is, what do you think is going to how your channel or what are your projects in the next five years? You know, just to see where the food bus is developing to. Um, yeah, I think I I I I don't know if I'm honest. Like within this period of time, I launched I launched a coffee business. Um, and I helped my wife launch a skincare business. So I'm like, I'm not a one, I, I'm not just a YouTuber and I get bored by doing just one thing. So, so, and, 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 you know, so that for me is like probably detrimental to my YouTube career to a degree. Um, having said that, um, I've done a deal with a production company in the US um, to develop my own TV format. And that very much interests me because I'd like to do more telly. I'd like to do, um, I'd like to move towards a situation where I'm working within a team. I've always worked within teams and this YouTube experience is extremely lonely. You shoot, edit, create, um, wash the dishes all on your own. And you can bring people in when you get to a certain point, but it's still, I find it quite lonely. Um, so I'm really interested in exploring the TV thing. I've also done a deal with a, a network in, in LA as well, who I've sort of like started optimizing my, cha my channel. And I'm in the process of just um, fashioning, to coming up with a new series. And what's great with working with this network in LA is what they do is, is that they've, gone through my whole channel and applied that uh, a level of analysis which is really exciting because they're able to optimize it all so it's so so it's it's got all the keywords it's got all the um right titles everything's being put up so that the al algorithms work better for it so they've done something that i would never do say again Why are they called? Is it like full, full screen uh, there's a bunch of them out there um and, and and like everything there's pros and cons with being with them but um so they've done that analysis of the channel which has been great but then what they're also what's great is is that the level of feedback that they give on what's worked and what hasn't is really excellent so they've been able to identify the top performing um uh, content that i've created and helped Hone, we've honed down what the elements of that content that's worked so well. And then they've helped me put a strategy or they've given me some feedback that enables me to create a strategy that means that I'm creating content that's going to satisfy me from a creative point of view, but it's also most likely to have traction. And so I'm in the process at the moment of, I've got like a five episode series that I'm just beginning to start putting together, which um, will take me all over the UK. Um, and it will be specific, 
like one of the key lessons mm -hmm. with you're going to create a YouTube channel is you go is you need to go niche. Um, it's not about diversity. It's about niche because people want to come. Basically, when you create a program, you need to upload at the same time every week for a long period of time. It's a little bit like your favorite TV show. If you tuned in to watch Friends on a Friday night and it was some other shit, you'd be like, whoa, what's happening here? Where, where, where are you? you? You need to create that dependency, but also that reliability, number one. Number two, they kind of want to see the same thing. People's time is so limited these days that they want to know what they're getting involved with. I'm going to give you five minutes of my time. I want to know what I'm getting. That's why a format works well, because they know, okay, he's going to cook a dish. He's going to ask how much it is. I want to see how much he says, because sometimes he overprices them, and, and that's just disgusting. And then I want to see how people pay. You know, is he going to win or is he going to lose? That format worked great because people waited to the end to see what the result was of the show. And it was the same every week. But the dish change. So niche is really important when you're creating a product on, 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 on YouTube. Um, and so for me, but now I've got to a certain size, now I can do diversify, which is what I'm doing. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's but a pleasure. Then, John or Free Pasca, um, where can people find you? If, uh, if yeah. Um, if you put Food Busker or John Quilter into the interweb, I will come up. So, um, yeah, and subscribe to John Quilter YouTube Food Busker. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.